Welcome home. I'm Dr. Tama, a minister, licensed psychologist, and sacred artist. And this is Homecoming, a podcast to facilitate your journey home to yourself. While I will provide weekly inspiration and mental health tips, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy. I'm so excited you're on the journey. If you want to request specific topics or share your progress, email me at homecomingpodcast at gmail.com. Also, after you listen, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Let's begin. I am so excited to be with you all for another episode, and on today we have such an important topic for the journey home, and that is dealing with depression, dealing with depression. And as we have been disconnected from ourselves, either for a season and for some may feel for a lifetime, there can be really a sense of despair and frustration Uh, There can be a season of hopelessness and powerlessness. And so I want to talk about how we can cope and deal with depression when it arises, how we can understand it within ourselves and also with our loved ones. So first, to really understand what depression is, I want you to know that it is different than sadness. So sadness is very temporary and uh, it has a low severity. And some people have experienced sadness, but never have experienced major depression. And so if you have not experienced major depression, you want to be really careful about uh, trying to advise or guide people who have really uh, been in a place of despair um, to uh, a significant extent. And so some of the symptoms of depression include uh, helplessness and hopelessness. When we feel like things cannot get any better than they are right now, and we know when we lose hope, then that can also be a place where we'll start having suicidal thoughts. Uh, There's something called passive suicidality, where even if I would not actively uh, take action to take my life, I may do things that are risky uh, because at this point I really don't care or I wouldn't mind not being here. Uh, Some people will even have fantasies about the relief that would come if they did not have to get up the next day. And so there can be a range of thinking and of gestures or behaviors when we think about the loss of hope and suicidality. And I saw someone put on social media recently that untreated trauma is really a root of suicide. And often people are suffering in silence. Not only might we feel hopeless, but also feeling helpless. So there is something called self-esteem, which you're familiar with. But there's another term, self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is my belief in my ability to do how capable I feel. And so if I'm going through a hard time, but I feel capable, then it won't be so overwhelming for me. It just may be exhausting. And I may say, oh, this is going to take a lot, but I'll get through it. But when I get to a place of not feeling capable, I don't feel able to hold this. I have lowered self-efficacy and that really can put me in a place of despair. Another part of depression is loss of interest. So the things that used to excite us, the things we used to enjoy are just not enjoyable anymore, that nothing feels significant, nothing feels worthwhile, nothing feels important. While I'm African-American, I spent a uh, part of high school, two years of high school in Liberia, West Africa. And uh, we, my family and I, we were evacuated because of the civil war that was happening there. And I remember uh, when we got off the plane and we were back in the States, I just really was in a deep place knowing that people that I cared about had been killed. And uh, when I looked around, like nothing seemed important. So uh, being a teenager, other teenagers wanted to hang out at the mall. And that just felt uh, frivolous to me to go to the movies. Felt like what would be the point? Like nothing, nothing uh, mattered. 
right? When you have faced uh, life and death, or even if you haven't, but are in a place of depression, uh, it is hard to get motivated, excited, interested uh, in things, even if those same things used to be enjoyable for you. And I want to raise that, especially because I know a number of our listeners are from faith communities, and that can even show up in your faith walk. So you might be a very spiritual person, and then you go through a period where just not into it, like it's not feeding me, I'm not motivated to go, or some people have gone through periods where they're no longer praying or no longer reading or studying, um, no longer attending services. And when when people have never felt that, uh, they can be very judgmental and harsh and not understand what that is. Um, But it really is important to extend to ourselves grace and compassion when uh, it is hard to find the joy, when it is hard to find the point or the significance, when things that used to nourish you just aren't nourishing anymore. Uh, It can also affect your appetite. So when we're depressed, we can either uh, increase our eating our And we had an episode on emotional eating. So some of us are trying to soothe ourselves with food. And then some of us just lose our appetite, right? And so what is our relationship between our depression and our eating? Uh, Not only whether we're eating, but sometimes what we're eating can change when we're in a place of depression. Uh, Depression can also affect your sleep. And so it can cause uh, insomnia where it is hard to sleep, or some people fall asleep but cannot stay asleep. And the other side of the spectrum is those who can't get up, right? So nonstop sleeping and just tired, tired all, you know, what did you do for the weekend? Slept. And so uh, it can really be that heaviness in sleep or the difficulty even falling or staying asleep. Uh, interestingly, depression can also show up as anger and irritability. And this is interesting because I think usually people only recognize depression if you look sad, right? If you're crying and look vulnerable. And there are some people who have not been raised to show that part of themselves. And so, for example, with men in uh, traditional masculinity, it is acceptable for a man to be angry. But for a lot of people, it's not acceptable for a man to look sad, that people will say, you know, that's weak or, you know, what's wrong with him or he needs to man up. And so uh, the anger or aggression uh, can often be a a cover um, or a symptom of the depression. Uh, Another one is the irritability. And we see this um, within uh, the black community. Oftentimes people will have a a stereotype and overgeneralization uh, saying that black women have a bad attitude. And often what they are commenting on is actually despair. It is actually depression. um, But people are not compassionate uh, to a woman with an attitude. People are not uh, compassionate when um, I'm on my last nerve. Um, But if we can shift our understanding of others and of ourselves to say like, why, why am I on edge? Why is everything bothering me? Uh, And often uh, it is a case of depression. We can have a loss of energy. So that is so hard because when you don't have energy to do things, then you feel Uh, powerless, you feel insecure. And then of course, the more insecure you feel, the more depressed you feel. So it's this vicious cycle of like, I'm so depressed, I can't do anything. And now I look at my life and say, what have I done? I've done nothing, which is depressing, right? So uh, for us to be tuned in, because especially sometimes with adolescents, when they're depressed, people will just call them lazy, right? We'll say, get out of that room. How come all you're doing is laying around? And sometimes we need to dig a little deeper to see there may be more to the story about why they're closed off. There may be more to the story about why they don't have any energy. And so we can feel worthless. We can feel guilty. And another one is difficulty concentrating or focusing, um, that what comes to the forefront of our thoughts 
are often the negative thoughts or the self-loathing, right, thoughts. The, uh, I'm angry at myself or angry at my life. And so it's hard even to uh, focus on activities, whether school or work. And then a last one I just want to mention um, are somatic complaints. And so these are especially uh, prevalent with people of color, with ethnic minorities, racial minorities, where... Uh, Often culturally and socially, it was not acceptable for us to be depressed. And so the depression manifests itself in our bodies. And so we have migraine headaches, we get nauseous, we have backache, but the root of the physical pain uh, is often an emotional pain and a despair. So when we consider depression and the journey home, we recognize that being disconnected from ourselves uh, really did often result in us feeling hopeless or powerless. And so how can we manage and deal with the despair? Uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, therapy and medication are important steps to consider. And I know a lot of people um uh, want to do the self-help route, and I'm going to give you some activities that you can do uh, within yourself, but there is also uh, an importance to giving yourself permission uh, for getting support, right? And so uh, the exercises and the things I'm going to mention, you can definitely uh, work to apply on your own, but uh, there is a gift to having someone who can walk alongside you where you don't have to mask and where you can tell the truth about what you're dealing with. So it is uh, this place of despair when we think about uh, for the medication that sometimes we need uh, that push, that, that ability to even get out of the bed so that you can do some of the things that you want to do. So we want to really adopt a model of healing by any means necessary. And it's not for somebody else to judge you or condemn you because that wasn't their healing journey, right? So we're going to reject shame when people will say, well, all I did was blah, blah, blah. And if you just do that, you'll feel better. Well, maybe that worked for them. That might not even be the whole story, but maybe that worked for them, but that's not your journey. And so to be open to the diverse ways that healing can show up for you. And I want you to know that some people are depressed in response to a situation, right? So I mentioned after being evacuated from the war, uh, really being in a depressed place, so there was an incident that happened, a situation that happened uh, that precipitated, that led to the depression. Um, but then there are people who also are living with lifelong depression um, that is not just in response response to a circumstance. So even once the circumstance face uh, passes, they still find themselves struggling. Um, and so we have uh, different experiences. And that's why it's important to be open and know that it's not a cookie cutter one size fits all. So a part of our uh, dealing with depression um, is this notion we have learned about in prior weeks of mindfulness. Mindfulness is about being in the present on purpose without judgment and with self-compassion. I'll say it again. Mindfulness is being in the present on purpose without judgment and with self-compassion. And so what we're really talking about is living in the present with g love, grace, compassion for myself, right? That's what it is. It's I'm choosing to be in the present moment because when I uh, am consumed by the past, then I can feel very stuck there. And that is the place of powerlessness because guess what? I have uh, bad news, good news for you. We can't change it. The past is unchanged. I might change how I think about it, but the actual events have already occurred. Yes. And so I give myself permission to turn the page knowing in a lot of ways the page has already turned. 
right? I've been looking backward, but the page has already turned. So I give myself permission to be in the present moment, not anxious about the future, not stuck in the regrets of yesterday, but what do I want to make of my right now? What do I want to do with my right now? And so being present in this piece about not judging myself, uh, if I'm depressed, I'm depressed. So I would invite you to have the freedom to admit it to yourself. Some people are in denial and don't want to acknowledge it or are mad at themselves for being depressed. Because here it goes. We do this comparison and say, well, other people have it worse than me. And so I should just be grateful. Well, should and are are two different things, right? I could say I should be grateful, but the reality is I'm depressed. So I want to invite you to tell yourself the truth on today about how you feel, to tell yourself the truth without judging it. It just it where you are. That's just where you are. And the only way that we can cope, deal, heal is to first be honest about where we are. And so we do that with... uh without judgment and with compassion for myself. Because I want to tell you, in most cases, if we heard somebody else's story, we would have compassion for them. We often are more compassionate toward other people than we are toward ourselves. And so what would it mean to be tender with yourself? What would it mean to be understanding and loving and giving yourself grace for where you are? Not only is mindfulness helpful, and you can think about starting uh, the day with some meditation of just clearing your mind and focusing on your breathing. So in secular meditation, you focus on the breath. Uh, some people prefer a faith-based meditation, and the you can focus on God. And what's interesting about that is from a faith perspective, God is breath, right? God is our very breath. And so uh, however you want to name that, it clears out the distraction, the discouragement, and it is only me here with my breath, or it is only me here with God. And I'm just going to be present to this sacred moment. Not only do we have mindfulness, but we also have cognitive therapy. And cognitive therapy is about shifting my thinking. Uh, So there's a proverb I think I shared in another episode, which says, as a man thinks, so is he, or as a woman thinks, so is she. And uh, that is an ancient proverb, but now we have cognitive therapy, which is really saying the same thing, that as I shift, S-H-I-F-T, my thinking, then I can shift my life because how I think about something changes how I feel about it. And once my feeling change is that affects how I act, right? I'll give you an example. So if someone walks in a room and doesn't speak to me, I can have the thought, oh my goodness, they hate me. They're ignoring me. They think they're better than me. I can't believe that they won't acknowledge me. Now, as I say that, I can start to get depressed. I can start feeling insecure. I can start getting angry even. I can start getting anxious. And so then what might I do with that frustration? I might uh, roll my eyes at them. I might shove a book to make some noise. I might run and tell some other people, uh, gossip about it because I'm going to get relief by talking about what a terrible person that is. Or the next person who walks in, I might do it to them, right? So I have set off this chain of events based on my thought, my interpretation. Now, let's take the same example. I'm sitting in a room. Somebody walks in and doesn't speak to me. And my thought is, oh, they must have a lot on their mind. Let me give them their space. I know, you know, it's rough because sometimes I have a lot on my mind. Then if I think that, I might just feel grace. I might feel peace. And what might I do out of that action? I might say a prayer for them. I might mind my business and focus on what I'm doing in the room. (laughs) I might even go over and speak to them instead of waiting for them to speak to me first. I might actually go over and say, hi, how are you? You see, so uh, some of us, and often it's related to trauma, we expect the worst. So we interpret uh, the worst possible outcome, um, and that puts us on the defense, on the offense. It puts us in combat mode. And can I tell you, living in combat mode is draining 
and depressing. And that's when we start saying, well, everybody is terrible. Every, you know, the world is full of losers. <laughs> everybody. So when I'm in that place, it keeps me stuck in the loop, right? So I want to encourage you this week when uh, some things happen that don't go your way or that are not pleasant to watch how you think about it, to watch the interpretation that you're making about it, and even what you're assuming that says about you, right? Because often we respond responding harshly because we think what people did or said is now some reflection of us and our worth and our value. And so I want to start being mindful of how I interpret things. And then as I start to shift my thinking, I'm going to feel differently and I can start acting differently. And my uh, statement I love to say is everything is not drama worthy, right? I mean, it, everything is not uh, big. So we have to have a scale and I can respond better in proportion to what's in front of me if I'm actually in the present instead of showing up, seeing things through the lens um, of my past. And so start to be aware of your thinking. And then another approach to uh, therapy with depression is a behavioral approach. And behavioral psychologists would say, instead of waiting until you feel better, just start acting as if. Meaning if I just start treating myself better, then that is going to activate me feeling better, right? I'll give you this example. I had a client who was dealing with depression and so um, he wasn't really practicing hygiene um, and had not been taking a shower. And you know, I said to him, I know you're very depressed, but before you come in next week, even though you're not going to feel like it, I want to invite you to take a shower. And as you're taking the shower, you may notice you actually start to feel better once you have gotten in that water, right? And so some of us have been stuck because we're waiting for a shift in our feelings. And sometimes we have to get active for the shift to happen, right? So uh, what are the things that if you loved yourself or if you had more energy or if you felt better, what are some of the things that you would do? And then even if you can't do them full out, to just do a piece of it, right? To just do a piece of it. I had a client and I let them know on YouTube, there are uh, there's chair aerobics, right? So when you're real depressed, you don't want to get out of the house. You're definitely not trying to go to the gym. But if you can get in front of that screen, and just move your arms, right? Just move your arms. So creating steps that work for you. It's not comparing yourself to anybody else, but for some of you, it's a triumph to get out of that bed. For some of you, it's a triumph to get in that shower. For some of you, it's going to be a triumph to either go for a walk or try to do some motion or even make a phone call. You know, I have people who will talk about nobody ever calls me. You know, and then we have to say like, but who have you called? Right. And I will know that sometimes we are calling and people are, it's not reciprocal. And then we might need a new circle of friends. So check out episode number two, which is check your circle. Uh, because if you are surrounded by one sided friends, that is a problem. Um, but we want to make sure that we're doing our part, right? That we're doing something to honor ourselves. Another approach to uh, dealing with depression is psychodynamic. And psychodynamic therapy is looking at the past, uh, the things that we have buried, because those things are embedded in us. And so we are walking around with a script um, of our unworthiness, of our powerlessness, of our helplessness. And the reality is you didn't write that script, that there were things that happened early on in your life that uh, plug that into your thinking. And so it then becomes about really healing the trauma and identifying the lie, right? Because these uh, bad events or these neglectful events told us some stories about ourselves that are not true. And so I have to come to a place of rejecting the lie so that I can actually accept myself. 
So social support is also important when you're dealing with depression. Um, trying to be around positive people because if you're in the wrong circle, uh, it can actually make the depression worse, right? If you're around people who are blaming and shaming, ridiculing, it can make you feel worse. So trying to be around positive people, nutrition is important, paying attention to what we are feeding ourselves and, and also what we are drinking or what substances you're using, because some of those things like, you know, alcohol is a depressant. So we drink to feel better, but you watch yourself. And then after you've been drinking for a while, you end up uh, coming down and feeling worse. So you want to be mindful about what you take in and the amount, right? About moderation. And is this really serving me um, or is this working against my mental health? And the last thing I'll say is our um, faith practice. So uh, not in a should way, right? Not in a controlling or condemning way, but a faith and a spiritual practice that is liberating, right? So there is a way that we can say, even when my mind is not cooperating with me and my body is not cooperating with me, that there is a me that is beyond this mind and this body, right? There is a me that is deeper than that, and that is my spirit. And so looking at what are the things that nourish my spirit. And as I said before, the things that used to nourish it might not do it anymore. So being open to exploring what is the thing in this season that speaks to my spirit. And that might be music. It might be nature. It might be a podcast. <laughs> Whatever that is to feed your spirit as you are going through. I am so glad that you are on this journey with us. And wherever you are, as it relates to depression, I send grace and compassion to you, and I am praying for relief and support for you. So on today, I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body, and spirit, welcome home. Away, beautiful.